see that there is a division between you and one of your children. Maybe it's even a broken relationship with a brother or sister, or maybe a co-worker. And I have served the church long enough to know that there are also broken relationships that often happen between those who are a part of a congregation and they worship and they fellowship and they do life together. There's no doubt about it that every one of us is probably dealing with a broken relationship Uh, That relationship may be about someone that we care deeply for. It may be someone that we love with all of our hearts. But there's brokenness. Now, no doubt about it, we probably all have one or more reasons why we have this broken relationship. And you know what? So many times they make sense to us, don't they? But I want you to imagine for just a moment, I want you to imagine this morning you sitting down with Jesus Christ and having your favorite beverage with Him, and mine would be Tim Horton coffee, but imagine yourself sitting down with Jesus and you told Jesus every one of the reasons and you tried to justify your reasons for continuing a broken relationship. What do you think Jesus might say to you? Would Jesus uh, commend you and would he say, well, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Or would Jesus say to you as you're trying to justify everything that you want to say, you know what, Your your reasons really don't amount to a hill of beans. You need to get back into the game. And you need to begin to do some work. You perhaps need to work it out. I think Kevin's question here in this movie clip, why don't you call them, is Jesus' question for you and me this morning as we begin this series on relationships. You see, Jesus desires that you and me find healing. He desires that we find restoration in our relationships. And Jesus Christ wants to offer to you and me His grace and His continued forgiveness as we continue to forgive as His people. You may be seated there and you may be saying, well, Pastor Tim, what kind of move can I make? What do we as Christians need to begin to do to move toward a place of healing when we're dealing with a broken relationship in order to rebuild that relationship? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that broken relationships are absolutely, absolutely nothing new. You see, a broken relationship did not happen the first time that you got hurt or the first time that you may have found your feathers ruffled. In fact, broken relationships go all of the way back to the Garden of Eden. Do you remember that scene where God comes in on the scene and He talks to Adam and Eve right after they've eaten the fruit from the tree of knowledge and good and evil? And God comes in on that scene and God wants to know what has happened. And I love that scene because I want you to know, church, God is still present with you and me in our lives when we sometimes screw it up. But God wants to know what happened, and God is talking to them, and good old Adam, what does he do? He shifts the blame, and he says, you know what? It was the woman who gave me the fruit, and I just ate it. And then the woman, not wanting to be left holding the bag, what does she do? She shifts the blame and she says, the serpent deceived me. That's the reason I ate it. I look at this story and I think to myself, can you imagine the argument that takes place between Adam and Eve as God throws them out of the garden? Probably probably Adam turned and said to Eve, 
I mean, where do you get off blaming me? You're the fault of all of this. Secondly, everyone is hurt by a broken relationship. And if you haven't ever been hurt by a broken relationship, you will be one day on this side of eternity. And it really doesn't matter who's at fault, because like Adam and Eve, we worry too much about who is at fault. You see, if you study scriptures thoroughly, you'll begin to realize that we are hurt regardlessly whether we have caused the hurt or the other person has caused the hurt. This morning, as we take the opportunity to look at our gospel reading, Jesus tells us a parable about two servants. And the king, of course, in this story is God himself. And the debt that you and I owe God could never possibly be paid by you and me. God paid that debt through his son, Jesus Christ. And the sin of the brother and the sister is minuscule by comparison. And yet, what do we do? We dare to hold that sin against another person. We dare to hold that debt against another, don't we? This week I decided, as I was looking at this parable, to do a little math. And I decided to read it out of the New King James Version because the New King James Version uses the monetary amounts of a denarii and talents in the parable. And I think it's important for you and me to understand the dynamics of this parable. And for any one of you who may be here and not acquainted with the Bible, that's okay because a parable is merely an earthly story that shares a spiritual application or a spiritual dynamic. And in that culture and in that day, a denarius was a day's wage for a common labor. And most people in that day were agriculture workers, and they received the amount of one cent per day for the work that they'd done. So I was looking at this parable this week, and I decided to do something. We're Hoosiers, aren't we? How many of you are Hoosiers? We're from Indiana. And I decided to look at this parable from our culture and our time. Minimum wage in Indiana is $7.25 per hour, and a standard day is eight hours, unless you work at Good Shepherd Church. (laughs) So what does that give you? About $58 a day. So 100 denarii would be equivalent to about $5,800. So that's what the second servant owed the first servant. $5,800. But on the other hand, the first servant owed his master 10,000 talents, which is equal to 6,000 denarii. Stay with me. I'm going back to Indiana uh, minimum wage again, 6,000 days of minimum wage would be $348,000, and then the amount times 10,000 would give you what? Over $3 trillion. That's what the king forgave the first servant for. This is what God forgave the first servant for. But may I remind you, church, that the first servant absolutely could not forgive the second servant for that pity amount of money. What's the nature of the parable? Jesus is teaching that our unforgiveness that we hold in our hearts and our lives grieves the heart of God. 
You see, the worst prison you can live in is a prison of an unforgiving heart towards someone else. If you refuse to forgive others, then you're only imprisoning yourself and you're causing your own torment. But I want to share the good news with you. Through Jesus Christ, we have a means and we have a way out. God unconditionally forgives you and me. And He helps us in our journey of faith to forgive others. And you may be seated there and you may be saying to yourself, Pastor Tim, how do we do this? What is our application for this? I think Kevin has it right. You do the work of forgiveness. You call that other person, you contact that other person, unless it would cause you further harm, and you sit down with them and you attempt to have a healthy, civil conversation. You do whatever you need to do to work it out. And sometimes that work that you do can be successful and other times it may not be. But you have done your part because you put the ball back in their court when you have conversation with them. And even more importantly, you acknowledge and you begin to tell the other person that you are sorry for anything that you may have done because as much as any one of us would like to think of otherwise. We too are a part of some of the broken relationships that we find ourselves in. Forgiveness is no small matter because the work of forgiveness is difficult. And forgiveness sometimes is not just a one-time event, but it's a continued process. And sometimes it takes time for us to work through all of the emotions before we can truly forgive. But I want you to know, once we come to that place, as soon as we should forgive and we've worked through everything that we need to do, God calls us to do that act of forgiveness. It's hard. It's hard to forgive someone who has hurt you or who has failed you or who has let you down. I remember several years ago, one of the most difficult days of my recovery journey was when I finally had to work through the process of confronting the person with the assistance of a personal counselor who violated me and made me a Me Too victim earlier in my life. However, today, I have forgiven that person. And I've moved on with great strength and no resentment. Or revenge. And I stand before you today no longer a victim, but a victor. And forgiveness in my life released the pain and helped me to stop focusing on the perpetrator, but to focus on the one who gave me the strength to forgive. This morning, Every one of us are sinners, and we fail. And as a result of that, pain and hurt are a part of our lives. And relationships become estranged, and therefore we need forgiveness. And we also need to offer forgiveness. However, in Christ Jesus, the hope and reality of forgiveness can be ours as we do life with one another and with God. In fact, if we work hard at forgiving like Kevin said, good results could come our way. How do I know that? Because Jesus Christ is hope always for a hurting world. I invite you to view the screen 
again. response to God's proclaimed word, I invite you to stand and let's take the opportunity to greet one another and pass the peace of Jesus Christ. singing bind us together lord bind us together with cords that cannot be broken bind us together lord bind us together bind us together Love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all of the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen body of the Lord Jesus Christ broken for you and me, the bread of God. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ poured out for the forgiveness of sins, the cup of salvation, the gifts of God given for us, the people of God. Body of Christ given for you, the bread of God. 
the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ given for you, the cup of salvation. I invite you to the table, a table where Jesus Christ is present and he offers his continued forgiveness and grace as we come and receive his body and blood. Shall we commune together?
I would invite you to stand for our closing hymn. I'm so grateful that God's Holy Spirit is at work. I saw so many people coming forward receiving communion who had tears in their eyes, and it just shows me that God's Holy Spirit continues to work in our hearts and our lives, shaping and molding us into the image of Jesus Christ. I trust that you will continue to know God's wonderful healing, restoring grace in your life. Let's uh, close by singing, what are we singing? Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. <laughs> As you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord lift his face upon you and be gracious to you, and may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Go, continuing to love God and your neighbor in all that you do. Amen.